Christ, oh, good evening, not so far. Um, my name is John Rea, and welcome to this R&D sharing of a new work, a uh, very exciting collaboration um, with the percussionist Dame Evelyn Glenny. Uh, it's a work that combines my interests in sound um, and composition. And what follows tonight is a 12 and a half minute film incarnation of the work in progress. Uh, and then a Q&A with John Gower, where I delve into some of the thinking behind the work and my plans for future versions and incarnations. Um, the Q&A is pre-recorded, uh, but you can uh, still respond. Uh, I would value any questions or comments, um, which you can type in during the live feed. Um, it's very important, as this is an immersive work, that you try and listen with headphones. Um, it does work in stereo and on speakers, but to get the full effect, uh, headphones are best. Um, I'd very much like to thank the Arts Council of Wales for their support uh, in developing this idea. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing responses after the show. Yeah. Sound is all around us and in a way we're living in this huge orchestra and I love to think that our environment is an orchestra that we can engage with every single day. Because there's sound around us, there's vibration. We can feel, physically feel the sound. In this project that I'm collaborating with John Rhea, and I'm, I'm so excited about this because, of course, the idea of using bells as the spine of this project is so interesting. Bells can ignite so many emotions. We relate to bells as soon as we're born to our last breath. Bells are resonant. They can be big, massive, heavy. They can be tiny. Now, of course, many of the percussion instruments I have in the collection are also resonant and they're almost bell-like as well. Bells can come in all different shapes and sizes. When I play something like this tam-tam and related to the wonderful breadth of a ringing bell, suddenly I forget that this is a tam-tam, but I try to bridge the gap, the sound gap, between the bell sound and the tam-tam sound and thus we create another sound. So this whole project is about exploration and having time to digest a sound, really allow that sound to be fed throughout our whole body. So I'm absolutely fascinated to see how we can bring this project together as a live performance, as an installation, as something that people feel they can touch, they can taste, they can smell, they can make it their own unique experience.
I'm delighted now to be talking to the composer of the work, to uh, John Rea. Uh, John, start with the inspiration for this piece, because as far as I'm concerned, people who've now seen it know that it is genuinely immersive. It's a sound immersion. And just as you would actually let yourself go into water and the waves of the water, so too are you drawn down and into the sound waves of this piece. Where did the first sound, the first noise, the first piece of ins inspiration come from? It's a long process, the inspiration. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, it, um, there are two answers to the question. There's my interest, I suppose, as a composer and as someone who deals with sound in that spirit of uh, the two Schaffers, Armare and Pierre Schaffer, that, that interest in sound, that concrete uh, interest that's grown in that tradition, experimental tradition. But there's also my interest in, in Welsh themes and landscape. Um, this grew when I was working on a previous project um, where the bell idea, the symbolism of bells, on a project with the Symphagans Museum Archive, which you of course saw called Atkavadi, uh, where I, the bell became a significant chapter heading between the movements of that piece. And I felt that there was a story to be told, the universality of the bell uh, as, as a significant sound. And I began reading Pierre Schaffer, um, the early music concrete artist who more or less designed the term and in the studio de Sailles in Paris in the 40s using turntables and his idea in search of a concrete music but he talks about sound as object that a sound can have a meaning an inherent meaning when you use it and I combine it with visuals here but you think of acousmatic music and you think well what will I do if I take this bell with all its associations and begin to disintegrate and pull it apart does it still have meaning as that sound does does it still imply all those associations that we have so it's an investigation into that in a way but there's a specific jumping off point for this idea where i came across the sunken bell mythology which is famous in wales but also around the world cantra you know, the mythology of lost land and water so the bell then combines with this idea of drowning um, and what really began the process specifically with this incarnation of this movement, if you like, was I was in Kumelan and in the Elam Valley with the re earlier reservoirs are. And there's a the church that they rebuilt to replace the drowned church, but they saved the bell that was from the drowned church and rehung it in the new church. And this, for me, created a link between that rather complex modern history we have and Wales's relationship to water and a link back to the sunken bell myth, which is in our, you know, in the folklore. But the folklore is universal as well. So I went up and used the sound of that bell uh, as a starting point uh, and recorded it using surround technology. And, began, and um, that, I suppose, formed the jumping off point for the idea and then the idea of water and my interests in techniques of sonic cartography in place that I developed in my work in St Fagans, where the buildings are divorced from context. So you use sound to imply that, obviously site specific, it's a little different than in this instance, though the piece is intended to be a performance, a live immersive experience in its ultimate form. But then I recorded with underwater hydrophone microphones in Ceredigion Bay, you know, the location, if you like, of Cantred Gwaelod, to create texture that I felt had meaning as well within the, the sandal, which I intend to immerse you, to em embrace you. So it's almost like I'm embracing you with this idea of the water and, and Wales, perhaps Wales' relationship to it, but what the sunken bell myths and the encroaching of water whatever that theme implies to you, you know. Um, of course, um, if there are places underwater in Wales, there's sometimes almost depth charges because they carry political resonances. They're about people in farmsteads who are displaced. Um, of course, the, the huge one is Truerin, which was a depth charge and a half when the people of Capil Kaelin were disenfranchised and moved out to supply water to 
the people of Liverpool. And similarly with um, the Elan Valley, um, it's an area which supplies, there's a huge area of standing water now, it's scenic, people go there to have their picnics, but also there's a huge pipeline taking water uh, out of Wales. So there is an undercurrent of um, politics and political concern to this. I, I have to be honest, that is part of what this incarnation of the work is, uh, in, at, in its essence. Uh, I'd like to think it's also an investigation in a more universal sense because there are other bell sounds that come into the texture behind. But if you like, I, there are little games, well games is the wrong word, but there are things that I do within the work. For example, there's a battle that occurs uh, after the initial uh, emotional strike of the Alan Bell, if you like. Gradually, halfway through the work, you hear a call to service bell from an Anglican church and the Alan Bell begins to take over. There's very much an idea of a battle going on here. Uh, so that, that was in my mind as I, as I use devices like that. They are hidden and I suppose to be felt and there's a direct communication. But no, the, these themes of perhaps uh, similarly to R.S. Thomas's poem, Reservoirs, you know, that Alan is interesting in that it has its watercolour appeal, but uh, perhaps this is the poem's harsher condition that he talks about in the... Uh, People, it is beautiful in Erlang, and uh, it's not a criticism, it's a criticism of the idea, of the taking of land, I suppose, as, as a general issue, but also for ecological reasons, you could say, you know, the eroding of landscape, the eroding of land, you know, to other, for ecological reasons. You know, it's, it's a rich seam of ideas, I think, but though there is a motivation that it's political as well, that, uh, certainly. I mean, it's interesting in the context of politicians talking about, you know, charging for water. I found that very much in my mind during the months of, of researching and going out into the field and recording, which I, I feel is also a very important part of what this work is in that it's rooted in place. But I like to think there is that universal idea that, that in, embraces the idea itself with specific references, certainly in the sound world that are important, certainly, yeah. Um, you have Dame Evelyn Glenny performing this piece, and yeah. this isn't the first time you've approached her, because I think you've tried unsuccessfully in the past to uh, collaborate with her. Well, to be fair, John, she approached me initially. <laughs> um, it was, uh, I met Evelyn Glenny first, but I was very fortunate to meet Evelyn. Um, it was actually through Faber Music, we both have an association. Uh, who were very kindly instigated or part of uh, helping me make this uh, R&D happen with Dame Evelyn, who was um, fantastic to work with. I mean, uh, a dream come true, really. Uh, I, we were meant to collaborate. My interest in sound uh, uh, has been a fascination for me for some time. And I was experimenting with pieces involving the turntable, where I saw a connection between um, you know, the Amory Shaffer cage tradition of experimentation, but with, at the time, the idea of sampling, um, which was also a turntable tradition, how I saw a link between them. And, and uh, Evelyn was, very, was looking for a, collabor a collaborator for a similar idea. Uh, uh, she'd worked with DJ Shlomo, a beatbox artist, and I went to see a performer we met, instigated by fame for music. And, um, yeah, alas, it didn't end up with a collaboration. It could be that I didn't have enough confidence then and that these ideas hadn't fully emerged. But as, uh, as this idea involved percussion as an important part, and there are several reasons why, but it's, it's a human response. Um, if you see the work, there's an important moment where you never see a bell, except that when Evelyn begins swinging the quartz bow, and I feel there's a humanity to that moment that is very powerful for me, where the tonality of the bell emerges at the end of the work after the dissonance, if you like, of the idea. And some of these ideas we're discussing, but also in a harmonic sense that we're going from a dissonant idea or a dissonant feeling, a darkness, if you like, the drowning of harmony, if you like, in this instance, and the idea to an emergence of harmony um, and tonality and 
the devices I'm hoping to use in a, in a longer incarnation of the work because it relies on an ambient poetic in a way, in, in an immersion, uh, which, which you interestingly refer to, it is I want to create instruments, um, bell plate instruments that are tuned to the harmonics of the bell. Uh, so the bell is made manifest in its harmonic form. Uh, and I've been talking to Matt Nolan Custom, uh, makes metallophone instruments. And uh, the idea would be then for the Alam Valley to become manifest in this form. Uh, so the in instrument, instrumental response is, is, is quite exciting. Uh, and also inspired in part by a composer called Jonathan Harvey, who composed a piece called Mortuos Plango Vivos Rocos, which is based on his son's voice and a bell sound. Uh, way back in the 80s uh, in a movement that they were called the spectral composers who rely on audio, on analysis of sound as a, as a starting point. And Gerard Grisi in France, who wrote a piece where the harmonic series of the bell becomes the caudal structure of the composition. So I, I kind of feel a homage to them in the processes or certainly influence in, in in the process here. So you have a completeness to the idea. Um, and I think there's a, that's, there's a fascination with the sound and where it meets the music, you know, where the two can come together in a piece of work, I think, is, is a fascination for me. Um, of course, there are other composers, uh, some of the more mainstream composers, who've been drawn to these sink, sunken lands and sunken worlds. And I'm thinking particularly of um, someone like Debussy. Well, funnily enough, um, Debussy came up in the research for this because he was inspired by, there's obviously a deluge myth that lies behind the sunken bell myths that are so prevalent. Um, again, the ecological theme arises, but there's Keris in Brittany, uh, on the coast of Brittany, it's almost the exact same myth, alpha, um, you know, folklore story as Cantor's Gwaelod, where the, the sunken cathedral and it inspired Debussy to write a textural piano piece. I uh, can't remember the French pronunciation, so forgive me, the Sunken Cathedral, where Debussy was important in, in eschewing kind of normal harmonic progression, even satirized Wagner, you know, in some of his more playful pieces. But it's about texture and using the soft pedal to blur the harmonic language. You could say what I'm doing is, is almost he began a process of dismantling that idea. So it's kind of nice in a way that, you know, those ideas are still, are still important now, you know, and we're highly influential in the way, with him and Sati, of course, you know. Uh, so I, I quite like the idea that he was inspired by that, uh, that myth as well. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice story that, and of course, these myths exist everywhere, you know, on the Suffolk coast in England. Um, uh, well, when we went actually to film um, and, to, and to collaborate um, with Dame Evelyn and when we recorded her performances, we came across in Rutland, Normanton Church, which, and there's a fabulous story about it where, this is just an aside, where they, they wanted to sink this very, shallow valley again for a reservoir for a local reservoir but they managed to campaign to keep the church but they had to submerge half the church so you have this bizarre vista as you arrive at the, at the bank of this reservoir with this half a church sticking out of it and it it's almost encapsulated and i took a lot of photographs i was very lucky to collaborate with he talvin walters we took some fabulous photographs of it and it seemed to encapsulate uh, in this one vista what, what, we were, what we were aiming at and it, it shows how universal a story it is as well. I think. Um, I've um, listened to the film or watched the music. I'm not sure what, which of those you do with this, um, but I've, I've listened to it um, twice now and what I found was um, I was both lulled in and mesmerised and hypnotised, but at the same time there was something just setting me on edge because there was enough dissonance amongst the harmony to just make me sort of shudder occasionally, almost like the appearance of half a church in Rutland Water. 
that that's not I, that's interesting. Yes, there is an intention for people to feel something. I mean, this is a film incarnation. It's not meant to be. This isn't how I envisage it in its final form. What I hope for. It's been a fascinating experiment. Uh, part of the research and the development of this was to investigate binaural mixing, uh, immersive mixing. Also, the response of live music to integrate the visual world, so, so it becomes a whole as a piece, as a, a work. Um, we weren't able to do it in this incarnation, but in its ultimate performed, immersive form, whenever we can do this. Um, would be that the sound world is truly immersive, that you're within the sound world that, that is created with a performance response, but that the visual world using sound reactive software and technology that I have been researching pulsates the very abstract visual world that I hope to use based on those water textures, which are very much inspired by landscape painting, you know, the, the idea of abstraction in, paint, in the painting tradition, landscapes especially. You know, I, I love the work of painters such as uh, Alvin Lewis um, or perhaps Owain Sorting, who's young and produces digital technology and digital interference. Whatever the right term is artistically, I'm not sure, but uh, I very much felt it's part of that tradition. I wanted to feel that it was rooted again in landscape, the idea of the visual as the sound is. So in performance, it, in this film version, we've had to cut between, though I feel it works uh, it, as an essay and it kind of stands in its own right, I'd like to think, but it's, a, it's an attempt to make, to, to pre present music in a slightly different way, to, uh, to not have an audience stage and performer, though I love going to see concerts or casual concerts. Uh, um, I was fortunate to have collaborated with the National Orchestra Wales, BBC. Um, my last project, but uh, this is different. It, it, it kind of merges the idea of musical performance with the theatrical arts, if you like, that it's an immersive idea, that, it's a, um, that I'm asking you to enter this world, this, this idea which will immerse you, uh, that a, a, an, imp, an embracing experience as opposed to, say, concert or whatever term you want to put on it. It's a, it's an attempt to do things differently, to present work and ideas in a unique way for me. But, um, and, and it draws therefore on ideas of ambient music. And by that, I mean the ambient poetics, you know, the, the, the idea that there's an ambience around us all the time, you know, and, and what I'm doing is bringing that ambience that we don't notice normally to a four, into a foreground. But whilst at the same time I'm a, I'm a composer and a musician and I have an instinct to create structure that flows perhaps musically. So I suppose a uh, uh, an idea in this work is, is, is that it's a journey from dissonance to an eventual tonality that emerges based on the bell. But uh, I didn't want it to be too long in this instance, but I want to develop that and extend that as an idea that you occupy a place it is part performance and the emphasis might change from the visual to the soundscape, to a performance, which plays around with foreground, middle ground and background as an idea and as an experience that envelops you. That. That's very much my goal in a, for an ultimate performance, um, which is quite exciting. Yeah. Um, I had this um, slightly fanciful idea when I was um, uh, listening to it, which is that um, obviously, there are, there's the bell and there's a sort of sense of drone because obviously you have the delay and the echo and so on of, of the bell. And I was actually thinking that um, I, as a listener, I, as, a, as an audience member, have actually got my own bell-shaped dome, which is <laughs> resonating, in tune with it because your music sets off the bell inside my own head. Am I just actually being pretentious and fanciful, or is there something in that? I'm hoping to create an ambience. You know, if if, if I think of other influences and, and people who use repetition or, or, or create drone music, if you like, you think of Lamontian, 
You think of a piece like Jesus Blood Never Fade Me Out by Gavin Bryars or The Sinking of the Titanic, which is a very formative influence on me when I heard it for the first time. Um, it, it, it's the idea of creating space, but the bell is, the sound is an object. The bell is such a prevalent, universal sound that I, what I hope is that it conjures, the bell will have a meaning and I'll have an association. You know, certainly historically it does uh, with worship, you know, whether to, as a warning, you know, as something that take, draws us to work, that used to keep time, that celebrates, you know, uh, has these associations that I, I hope, I, I think instinctively in all of us, you know, it's interesting during lockdown and the traffic noise and that background ambience, if you like, reducing, certainly last summer, where you began to hear the bell, etc. cetera, Cardiff. Um, and again, that, and I, 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 it was a lovely moment for me because I thought that's the significance of the, of the bell to us. You know, it has a significance in other cultures, you know, that are more personal, perhaps. Um, you know, uh, in, in more Eastern cultures. And the, the mythology is based on bell ideas for a reason, I think. Uh, you know, the, not only were they um, communal, but they were private and personal. And I hope that association is obvious, but th there is also the political in, perhaps, small p in, the, in this case. Um, but I hope that it's immersive and I'm glad that you, be, that you felt in it, uh, drawn into a world that I, that I hope then allows a listener, certainly the duration is different to an ultimate performance, which would be far longer, that allows the mind to perhaps drift maybe into these ideas that are, you know, perhaps there in the work, but not so obviously stated, that it is a meditation perhaps, you know, I'd say the dissonance could be a channeling of anxieties of lockdown, being drowned by this, these circumstances that we find ourselves in in the difficult days that I'm sure we've all had. I bet. You know, I'm sure there's an element of that in the sound world as well. But it's, I, I'd like to think that it, it encourages meditate or reflection would be the right word. I was going to say meditation, but I think, and perhaps the themes that are more overt than others, I hope are in there somewhere. You know, so um, you know we'd have to um, concur and agree on some sort of anxiety drifting into work at the moment, but by the same token, you can congratulate yourself on actually having to make something new. With Dame Evelyn Glenny and with Hugh Talvin Walters and with the other people who've actually worked in this, to actually create something of beauty and meaning and resonance despite these troubled times. I feel very fortunate and I, um, I've done it in, in my introduction but uh, to, to be offered the stabilization grant by the Arts Council has been a lifesaver in, in a way but this idea has been uh, around for a while and, and I feel very fortunate during this difficult time to have had something to focus on. Uh, has been valuable and it, um, it, yes, I mean, it, it, I am lucky to have had this opportunity, I'm aware of that. Uh, and I have to say, extremely lucky to be collaborating with someone of the, um, the ability of Dame Evelyn Glenny is quite transcendent how, and very fascinating to me how she performs and how her relationship with what she does uh, is a very significant part of this. And I hope we'll draw in perhaps other audiences uh, for an eventual performance that I feel perhaps don't come, uh, don't listen to this kind of work, but I, I, I feel she brings an amazing ability in improvisation and understanding and musicality that uh, um, also made this an amazing experience. You know, I'm lucky in many ways for, to have had this opportunity and I hope to pursue the idea to its ultimate uh, incarnation, you know, with Dame Evelyn's assistance. One of the things that um, occurred to me just before we pressed the start button on the mighty Zoom machine, which of course we didn't know about <laughs> before all this started, was that there are you surrounded by turntables and speakers and the tools of your trade 
and I've got my books behind me. And there's yes. one word that came to mind, which I think is a bridge between your world and mine. And that is a single word which the poet Gillian Clark uses to describe the little saturation of waves just as they reach the shore of a lake or a reservoir, which is yes. the word sure, S-H-I-R-R. And that double uh -huh. R at the end of it keeps the word moving on. As yes. Ever. Yes. There is that feeling of progress and progression because the waves don't repeat. Yeah, the, the waves are unique in their formation and so on. Mm -hmm. But there is a patterning and we watch the patterning and we're lulled into it. And then you actually begin to disturb the image somewhat mm -hmm. so that the images are slightly out of kilter in the same way that the music is out of kilter and uh, dissonant. That was part of the idea. Um, I was very fortunate to work with Nick Finch, um, whose background is in uh, having in VJ culture with, with the visuals responding to sound or to music. Um, uh, and I felt that was an important aspect and a progression, something for me to explore. It's again, it's about the object. It's about the, it's about abstraction, which I've already talked about, but it's also about if you, if you glitch, if you, if you interfere, like I disintegrate the bell sound to give it duration. When it's disappeared, the strike, it's no longer bell like, does it still have a meaning? Does it still have that association to the listener? It's, it's a very, um, I, I suppose, <laughs> sound focused idea and process but that I, I think it's an interesting one because you obviously hear the bell um i wanted to see what was possible it, it, it's very much inspired like i say by that painting tradition and a wave in creating that immersive idea and that, and that immersive experience for for it to feel like a complete experience not not always have tagged on the image if you like you know that, that, the intention is that these two elements do coexist in presenting this idea or, or the themes and ideas that exist, whether sonic and musical, it might, um, it's how I'm inspired by these ideas that we've discussed. Um, so that was the intention uh, and also to begin the experimentation with this sound reaction, you know, a reactive the image responds. I've spent so much of my career scoring films where the music is responding to the image. I, I like the idea of it happening the other way around, I suppose, in a way, deep down. But I, I, I feel it's powerful. I feel it would it'll be very powerful in performance. Um, you know, the, the ideas are developing, you know, even as we speak, you know, the, the, there are many ways the work could go, but some ideas are quite set and I think this experimentation has allowed me to, to reach a point where I'm ready to go with it in a way where the ideas are set enough for, for a potential performance to be quite a, an exciting prospect. Um, I've known you for many years now, we're beginning to show our age, but um, you were saying earlier about your interest in sound. I'd have to go a stage further and say that you are obsessed with sound <laughs> um, uh, because you have forever been listening to the work of other composers, listening to sounds, gathering sounds, gathering sounds underwater now. And it seems to me that, um, you know, looking at all your work uh, recently, as you've unshackled yourself from writing to order for film and TV, that in that liberation there has also been a real investigation of yourself, of yes. Welshness, of your internationalism as a composer and as someone who is interested in, 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 in the world around you. Um, you've had an interest in heritage and history. And as someone once said, there is no such thing as history, only histories. So in your work in St. Fagans, there were the voices of the people who had worked the land and had worked the, yes. the coal. There aren't any voices in this piece, but it seems to me as if it's still a meditation upon yourself as well as the wider world. I certainly agree. As I've become older, as you kindly point out, John, uh, Welshness and belonging, it's something that developed during the creation of that work, which was a collaboration with 
folk museum St Fagans and their sand archive. I was very lucky to have that opportunity. I came up with an idea whilst working on that was I had my family photographic archive and I looked at the several boxes I had in storage and went, well, do you know what, that archive is no different to that wider archive. They, they represent the same thing. So what then began was a personal voyage of discovery in my family archive. Um, a more personal investigation was about personal belonging whilst looking at an idea of national identity at the same time. So I suppose an emotional connection began this process of, of, of investigation as to what's important. I mean, on an easy level, do I have something left to say having spent a lot of time composing to order, if you like, though I still love doing that. And, uh, there would, there's uh, a lot of satisfaction in collaboration, uh, which I love. Uh, but I suppose where this is concerned, of course it's more personal, because you begin with what moves you, what's important to you as the jumping off point, or you pick up that narrative or that story or that fascination, which is, yeah, possibly an obsession, um, yeah, probably, definitely. Uh, you use the means that you feel you can express yourself best um, to perhaps articulate those feelings and those ideas. Uh, so I think there's been a process. And with this work, you talk about the voices of Spaniards, there are no voices there. There's a distillation of process, I think, of purely looking at sound, because this, these ideas were, ex were in that work at Kavadi. But I've distilled the process, distilled the sound world, distilled the idea into its pu into a purer form, if you like. You know, looking at just what pure this one sound, what does it mean? You know, um, rather than all of these voices in a large collage, uh, as a jumping-off point, to a simplifying of language, perhaps in the sound. But I think the motivation to drive. Um, that it is about land, it's about lost land, it's about water, it's about belonging to that land and what these myths mean, what that contemporary history means to us as Welsh people. You know, that was very much there. But uh, there's also that obsession and that fascination as well. And I felt the two, how do you, that, that sound object idea, how do we, does, does it have a resonance, as you say, is the work able to convey that? One thing that, um... Uh, this whole process has been is it's been about research and development so you've been in investigating things what have you mainly learnt in terms of the the research aspect of it to begin with um, what, is the, what have you learnt about uh, yourself and your gift and interest as a composer and worker with sound that's a hard one to answer that's a, a big one to answer I there is the technical, where the work specific, that there are, certain, there are techniques. Uh, I've been lucky enough with collaborators who taught me a lot about surround mixing. I worked with Stuart Jones uh, at the University of South Wales. Um, I've worked with Nick Finch, who's taught me about um, sound reactive software. There, there are those obvious um, lessons that I've learned. Um, I suppose for coming from a compositional background and someone with always a fascination in the conceptual, this kind of treads a line between what is musical narrative, you know, traditionally musical, and what is sand art, you know, or installation, if you like, or experience, or an ambience. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting where I think the line is between these two. Whilst still emerging, I mean, I've come to this point like, um, having the confidence of, of, have I learned to have more confidence in presenting my own work? This, this is what's interesting about doing uh, this research and development for the first time <clears throat> and allowing you to investigate and ask probing questions, I suppose, is, um, is part of that process of learning. And I don't, and I, my fascination and my drive to learn has led me to approaching someone like Evelyn Glenn, you learn about musicality, you learn about, you know, um, what's possible, you know, what means of expression, the subtleties of expression, and how powerful they can be. Uh, but you inevitably learn in the highs and lows of creating a work, always learn something about yourself. 
I think. I think that's inevitable. Um, so uh, it's hard to know. I, I, I'd like to think um, that it's important that you know that the work has has a has a power to it, or that, uh, that it has a future to it. You know, um, and I'm very fortunate to have collaborators who've given me that faith throughout the process. You know, in, in their enthusiasm for it. Uh, you know, not only Dame Evelyn Rennie, but uh, the others too. Um, you mentioned uh, the the future. Um, if you were, if the Celtic gods smiled upon you and you were allowed <laughs> to um, expand this, because obviously it needs to expand both in terms of uh, duration, but presumably there are ways of expanding it in terms of depth um, and placing it in a, a live space, whatever. If the Celtic gods granted you your wishes, how would you really wish to um, present this in the future? Obviously, as a live work, but where would you present it and how might you present it? I'm not quite sure. I, I conceptually know, I have a very clear idea of how I envisage it staged. Um, I, I see it in a space um, using abstract texture and of the water itself. I, I suppose I mentioned this earlier in a question earlier. It's about blurring the lines between what is performance, what, uh, musical performance, what is installation, perhaps, what is theatrical, what is sound art. A merging of these elements where the emphasis changes as you experience it over that duration you know we could even be performance and, and installation that stays within that space I, I I'm there are a lot of ideas flowing around um but looking at it as a as a performance I I want it to be immersive I, I want I want it to embrace people I want people in the world uh and and for it to be experienced in that way using all the techniques we discussed you know that's I, i'm very excited that uh, by the prospect of doing that um and with the continuing interest of collaborators as to where i do like the idea of performing this um not just within wales because there are very well themes as we've discussed but i like the idea of it going further afield certainly um because i, I have I, this I, I feel the themes are universal as well I have this idea that it might be nice to start with a small bijou contained setting, let's say the pumping house in the Elan Valley. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then that's how it starts its tour and it finishes in the Birmingham Symphony Hall. <laughs> and just by actually performing it in these spaces, they will change their political resonances as well as their artistic contexts. That, that's an interesting one. I, I do like the idea of it, you know, you could discuss, you could say Liverpool as well, you know, that it, it's a, a difficult history, a complex history that, that we all share. Um, but there, though that's true, there is a universality of the bell here that makes it an idea that I hope has a resonance beyond these specific issues. Though I, that Alan story is a, a powerful metaphor as well. You know, you um, encouraged me to read the Alan Valley Clearance, a uh, book that's been published recently, which is fascinating, where it talks about how Westminster and in Parliament they discussed people's lives, you know. And though this isn't as well known because it isn't Troerin, it isn't the talisman that Troerin is, I feel it still has a resonance. So, yes, where one performs it, perhaps. Uh, I'd, I'd like an awareness of these ideas, but I like a meditation on the bell as well. The idea of perhaps the ecological themes of, of water, because the bell myths are worldwide. Uh, they're not just Celtic or British or European. You know, there are stories everywhere. I, doing my research, I found um, these astonishing stories from around the world. Um, I'm not, you know, lovely idea, but I, I think I, I experience it as a live performance which is immersive using these different elements. Uh, as to where I'd love the idea of a performance in London as well, close to the seats of power perhaps, um, and in the amazing theatres there, which I frequented myself when I used to live in London. I, I love the idea of a performance in uh, uh, either 
performance spaces such as at LSO St Luke's in Shoreditch where I often go and see London Contemporary Orchestra performing because of the they're very forward-looking in the use of music and sand and I feel they're kindred spirits so you know there are, there are musical reasons sonic reasons but also those reasons thematic reasons perhaps where um where I'd like, I'd like it performed everywhere let's be honest but um you know in the first instance it would be nice to, to begin somewhere I think more local perhaps and at this stage in the development you positively encourage people to react to it to discuss it yes. um, in words be they in Welsh or in English because yes. that's part of how you not only um, gauge the resonance of the piece but also help to determine its future so as one member of uh, one of the first audiences uh, uh, for this new work uh, let me congratulate congratulate you warmly Gresog John, uh, may its peals and its hum and its <laughs> chime uh, resonance far into the future. Diolch yn fawr iawn i ti, John. Na, diolch yn fawr iawn, John. Diolch yn fawr iawn, John. Hwyl.